Hi, so the semester is really moving along here. We're up to week nine of a 13 week class. So we're in the home stretch, I would say. And this week we're making a pretty big transition. We're moving on from discussing administrative law to litigation resources. And as a matter of fact, we're making a bigger transition than that. During the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about how to research different areas of primary law. We started with cases, then we moved on to statutes, and we finished up with administrative law last week. And now for the next two weeks, instead of focusing on finding primary law, we're going to explore resources that help practicing lawyers actually practice in their specialty area. So this week, we'll talk about the various resources that are designed to aid litigating attorneys, drafting papers, preparing for trial, conducting trials, and evaluating settlement offers. And next week, we'll move on to my area of specialty back when I practiced, which is the kind of resources that are available to corporate transactional lawyers, so lawyers who are doing deals, mergers, joint ventures, and simple things like employment agreements and certificates of corporations, put housekeeping documents. But anyway, we'll spend more time talking about that next week. So for now, here are the resources that we'll talk about for this week. In the video lecture, we'll talk about dockets and court documents. And then in the class lecture, we'll talk about litigation tools. You can see here that there's a number of different resources that fall under the category of litigation tools. So we'll spend a fair amount of time in class, not only talking about what are litigation tools, but where do you find them and what do you do with them once you do find them? All right, so dockets, that's what we're gonna start with. And everybody ends up loving this topic and playing around with the dockets. And it is a really cool thing to know how to do. So. What is a docket? It's basically just like a table of contents for all the materials that have been filed in a court case. So it isn't the court documents themselves. So it isn't the complaint or the orders. It's a listing of those documents, usually ordered by date, with the most recently filed document appearing at the end of the docket sheet. What sorts of documents will you find listed in a docket? Just to name a few, you'll find complaints, answers, motions, briefs, orders, and lots of other different things. As I said, basically everything that's been filed with the court for a particular case will be listed on that case's docket sheet. So you can see how useful this would be if you were looking for something to help you draft a particular order or kind of answer or a complaint that had a particular cause of action in it. You could use it for precedent, but you could also, with the docket sheet in hand, examine the entire life of a case from the filing of the complaint all the way through the final judgment issued by the court if you were interested in doing appeal work or for whatever reason that you might be interested in a case, this would be a good way to see when were the conferences held, what did the judge order, any reason why you might be interested in a particular case, a docket sheet would be a good place to start. So where do you find dockets? You can find docket sheets in a bunch of different places in a wide variety of databases. Bloomberg Law has by far the most useful and deepest docket collection. It's kind of ironic that they also have the best corporate transactional resources, so we'll be spending a lot of time in Bloomberg Law both this week and next week. So Bloomberg provides not only the docket sheet, which is the listing of the documents, but for many cases, Bloomberg also allows you to access and download copies of the documents listed in the docket sheet, which you may have thought you could get anywhere, but you can't. Most of the resources that we're going to look at, it's just the docket sheet, and then you'd have to go search for the documents somewhere else. So you can also access U.S. Supreme Court dockets from their Supreme Court website. For Court of Appeals and District Court cases, this is the federal level now. Federal courts publish docket information on PACER. We'll look at that in a minute. And then these dockets are also available on Bloomberg Law. And then finally, you can access some Supreme Court and lower federal court dockets on Westlaw and Lexis, but the coverage is definitely not as good as it is on Bloomberg Law or PACER. At the state level, many states publish their docket information, again, this is just a docket sheet now, on their court's website. And you can find limited coverage of state documents on Bloomberg Law, Westlaw, and Lexis. Again, Bloomberg's docket databases are the best. And then Bloomberg also has some limited coverage of foreign dockets. So you might be able to find a docket and the underlying documents of uh, litigation that's going on in a foreign country, but it's limited. You can't assume that you're going to find everything there. All right, so let's actually now take a look at how do you search for dockets. Here I am on the Supreme Court website and I'm going to search for Supreme Court docket. Click on that drop down case documents and then the link docket search. And once I do that, I'm taken to this page and I can use that search bar and put in either keywords on the issue of the case or what I'm going to suggest is you go there with either a docket number, if you can get it from the web, or the case name. Here I entered Altitude Express v. Zarda to search for one of this term's cases. In Zarda, as you might remember from our week three lecture, the court's going to consider whether Title VII protects LGBT employees. 
So note that when you search docket sheets, you're searching the sheet itself and not the information contained in the individual court filings. So because of that, I recommend broad searches such as the party names or the docket number if you can find it. As you can see, I put in Altitude Express v. Zarda and it happened to be the second result that came up. All right, so let's actually take a look at the docket sheet. There it is. And you can see it kind of gives you the whole life of the case. It begins with the cert being granted and then it goes on from there. Motion briefs filed, orders entered, and arguments heard. As with most Supreme Court cases, the list goes on and on and on with the significant dates and the very many amicus briefs that are filed. You can look up at the top of that and see a bunch of amicus briefs were filed on this case. You can go ahead and click on this questions presented link and you can see the legal questions that the court's actually going to consider. It should be interesting to see if the court makes some new law in this area, this particular term. Okay, moving on. Let's take a look at PACER. PACER stands for Public Access to Court Electronic Records. It's an acronym. PACER is the electronic database which contains federal case and docket information. From PACER, you have access not only to the docket sheet, but also to the underlying documents that are listed on the docket sheet, so the cases, filings. And that's with a pretty big caveat. That's as long as the papers were filed electronically, because some courts still don't do that. So if a federal court doesn't require electronic filings, you still might not be able to get a particular case. And obviously, this is becoming less and less of an issue as time goes on, but it's still something to keep in mind. The other thing to keep in mind is that PACER charges a fee, while as Bloomberg's dockets are pretty much pulling all the information that can be found on PACER. So almost anything you can find on PACER, you can also find on Bloomberg through its dockets tab. And while you're a student here at PLS, you can access all of these documents for free through Bloomberg Law. And in fact, if you find a federally filed document that's not available on Bloomberg, you can request that Bloomberg retrieve it for you from PACER and it will pull it from PACER for you. So to search PACER, you're going to need a party name or a docket number. So unlike Bloomberg, you can't do keyword searches to try and find a case. So here's how from the home page, if you were doing a search, you would click on this link, find a case, and then enter the case name or the docket. PACER also provides a helpful training website. So let's just take a look at that. You can actually go into the database and practice locating real dockets and retrieving real court filings just practice and, and do some of this for free before you start actually doing real docket searching. Incidentally, you may be wondering why am I showing you PACER if Bloomberg has the same dockets and doesn't charge a fee? And the reason is simple, because while you have access to Bloomberg for now, you might not have access wherever you go for your job. So it's good to know about PACER as well. All right, so let's actually take a look at Bloomberg dockets. As I mentioned already, Bloomberg's an excellent resource for dockets. Not only does it have good coverage, lots of courts available, you can also usually retrieve copies of the documents that are listed on the docket sheet. So if you find a complaint listed on a docket sheet, Bloomberg will allow you to actually download a copy of that complaint. And again, as I mentioned, there's no fee to search for or retrieve files from Bloomberg while you're here at BLS, while there is a fee to pull documents from PACER. So Bloomberg's the place to go pretty much all the time. I can begin a docket search on Bloomberg right from the landing page by clicking on this dockets link. Then Bloomberg provides me with this template and I can just start filling in all of the information that I have about the case that I'm looking for. So I can search for a particular court or I can search all the courts. There's all of these different search fields that you can use. You can search for a particular party name, an attorney, a firm. If you have a docket number, you can put that in. Or you can just use a keyword search using the issues in the type of case that you're looking for. For the best results, it's probably a good idea to use a combination of two or more of these fields. You'll just get fewer results, but they'll be more highly relevant. A great feature of Bloomberg Dockets is that you can choose to search the full text of the documents listed in the docket sheet. This isn't true for the other docket databases. When you run a keyword search in most docket databases, you're searching the text of the docket sheet only, not the underlying documents. All right, so let's do a test search. Let's assume I was interested in finding out more about the case where Stormy Daniels, aka Stephanie Clifford, sued Donald Trump for libel. If I entered the keyword libel in the keyword field and Stephanie Clifford in the party name field, Bloomberg will search not only the docket sheets, but also the actual court filings, complaints, briefs, motions, etc. for my keyword party name combination. Here I return six dockets, and the first result is the case that I'm interested in. So this is what a docket looks like on Bloomberg Law. You can see the whole life of the case starting with the filing of the complaint. If I want to look at the complaint, I can. On Bloomberg, a view hyperlink means the document's immediately available to view. 
a request hyperlink, like on this document, means I have to wait a few minutes, or for state cases, the document might not be available to me at all. And let's see how this looks. So here's the complaint that's available to me right away. I can download it, share it, put it in a folder, etc. And here's the message I get when a document isn't immediately available. While you're here at BLS, always accept the collection fee. You don't have to fill in this client matter, and you can just always say accept because we're not going to pay anything extra with our academic subscription. The worst thing that could happen to you with some state cases if they haven't been electronically filed and Bloomberg would have to send a courier to the court to copy the documents is you'll just get an email saying you aren't entitled to view the document. So you don't lose anything by saying you want to accept the charges for any document you're interested in looking at and you can just say accept and go forward from there. Here's another way you can use Bloomberg dockets. Rather than searching for the docket of one court case to see the history of that case, you can use Bloomberg dockets to search across all court dockets for a particular type of court document. Maybe you want to find a brief that argued issues similar to your case. Maybe you want to search motions filed by your opposing counsel in prior litigations. Or maybe you want to see the past orders of a particular judge to try and figure out what arguments that judge favors and what arguments they hate. Using Bloomberg dockets, you can do all of that. You just have to use this template to enter your keywords, your court, your counsel or judge name, depending on what you're trying to find, and then select filing type by docket key. Now you select the kind of court document that you'd like to retrieve, only briefs, for example. Run that search and Bloomberg will give you copies of all of the briefs that meet your search parameters. So one last thing before we leave Bloomberg Law. When you're working with dockets, it's important to make sure that the docket was recently updated. So check at the top of the docket sheet for the date of the last update. If it's not current, like within the last day or so, just click on Update Docket. And then Bloomberg Law will go ahead and update it. It'll do an electronic search and see if any additional filings have been made. And it'll email you again. This is all kind of automated. You'll get an email to your account that you set up when you set up your Bloomberg Law account. And it'll tell you that the update's complete. And then if you're interested in tracking the document, you can click on the Track Documents link and Bloomberg Law will email you every time there's a new update to the docket. So if you're an attorney or a law student and you're following a particular case, this is a great feature because anytime anything's filed on the case, you'll get an email telling you what's happened and then you can go back to the docket and take a look. All right, so let's take a look at dockets on Westlaw because you may not have Bloomberg Law wherever you go. Fortunately, docket coverage on Westlaw is not nearly as broad as on Bloomberg Law. In fact, often you're just provided with a docket sheet with no links to the underlying documents like you are on some of the free resources. But you can search for dockets right from the Westlaw landing page. So here I'm going to show you there's dockets. First, I select that. Then I go ahead and select a jurisdiction. What jurisdiction's dockets do I want to search? Here I'll choose New York. And then I'm going to be given a list of courts that I can search. So there's the state courts above or the federal courts that have New York as their jurisdiction. And then you can always click on this little I symbol that is a scope note, and it'll tell you what information is contained in the source that you're searching. So that goes across Westlaw databases, but it's kind of more important here in Docket so you can see what are you searching and whether you can hope to find what you're looking for. Also, just like in Westlaw's case law and statutes databases, Westlaw's docket database has an advanced search feature. After you select your jurisdiction, click on the advanced search button next to the main search bar. And then you can get the template so that you can customize your search. You can search by party name or docket number. Westlaw also allows you to run a keyword search, but remember that this is just searching the docket sheet and not the underlying documents. Docket. As with Westlaw, docket coverage in Lexis is not as good as in Bloomberg. To search dockets in Lexis, select dockets from the landing page, and then we would just pick our jurisdiction. Here I'll pick New York. Once there, I can either do a keyword search, but again, remember I'm just searching the docket sheet, not the underlying documents. Or I can use this advanced search feature, which is like we saw on Westlaw, and I can use it to put in the various parameters that I have. Really great if I have the docket number, or at least if I have the court and the party names, perhaps the counsel that are representing one of the parties, then I'm able to find my case. So that's Lexis. And then what about free resources for dockets? And you can access dockets that are filed with the New York State Courts from the New York Courts gov website. The URL is right there on the slide. And from the landing page, you would first need to select the appropriate courts to search. So here I'm going to select Web Civil Supreme, click on that link, and then it brings up this page. 
And then you need to decide how you want to search. You either search by index number, which is what they would call a docket in New York is the index, party name, attorney, or judge. Index number, as I said, is New York courts use instead of docket number. So there's no keyword search functionality at all. So you really have to know about a case and have some information about the case before you're able to successfully use this particular website. All right, so that wraps up dockets. Now let's talk about how do you find the documents actually listed on the docket sheet, briefs, orders, and all sorts of motions. These are called court documents, and we'll talk about them in a fair amount of detail now. Now, obviously, one of the places you could do is Bloomberg Law. I showed you that you have access to all of these court documents that are underlying the docket sheet, but there's other places also that you can go if you're out there and you don't have access to Bloomberg Law. So first, you need to know what court documents are, and then knowing how to find them can actually be incredibly valuable to you as a new attorney. As I mentioned, you can review these documents to examine how others are arguing their legal issues. You can use them as a model for your own court documents. So if you're drafting something, you can look and see what experienced practitioners, how they put it, what arguments they use. And you can use them as a research tool to monitor how law in a particular area is developing. So you can see what people said a while ago and what are some of the new arguments they're coming up with now and which ones are favored by the particular judge that you're appearing in front of. So to put it another way, what issues are being litigated by parties similarly situated to your clients and what arguments are being used before the courts. And then obviously you want to see which ones won and which one lost before you use them. So you can see why you would want to get your hand on these documents. Here's some of the places where you can get these documents. For Supreme Court documents, you can try going to SCOTUS blog. SCOTUS blog publishes briefs filed with the United States Supreme Court. Everything's available there for the current term. So I'm going to select that Sarda case that we talked about, and then I can go ahead and take a look, download any of these briefs that I'm interested in. You can see all the briefs are highlighted. I can also go to the Department of Justice Office of Solicitor General website. Here I can only get briefs that were filed by the Solicitor General. I can't get briefs filed by other parties, but the coverage is very good. For some cases, it goes all the way back to the 1980s. So you can get briefs, pleadings, and motions from a variety of places. We've already seen how to do it through Bloomberg's docket database, and you can also do it through PACER. Wausau and Lexus have separate court document databases. So their dockets databases don't have the underlying documents, but they have separate databases that do have some trial court documents. And then many firms and policy organizations also make their own briefs available on their organization's website, sort of as a form of attorney advertising, or maybe it's a public service. Maybe I'm being cynical. Westlaw has by far the deepest trial courts documents and briefs database. So to access the trial court filing or the briefs, select the appropriate resource from the main menu. There's their briefs database. There's their trial courts documents database, which is going to be other documents filed other than briefs. And then there's their trial transcripts and oral arguments. So if you're actually looking to see a transcript to see how something was argued in the oral form, you would click on that. So here I'm going to select briefs. And then once I'm in the database, I can select the appropriate jurisdiction and run a keyword search. So let's assume I was looking for briefs relating to the recent litigation on New York City saying that you could no longer sell giant cups of soda and other sugary drinks. So I do a keyword search, sugary drinks, and ban. If I use the filters on the left, I can limit them to New York Court of Appeal briefs if I knew that that was where this litigation ended up. And all of these briefs have to do with that soda ban case. Here's the first brief listed, the Amica Curie brief from the Chamber of Commerce. You can download a PDF of the original brief if you're site checking. All right, to search briefs on Lexis Advance, I'm going to select briefs, pleading, and motions. And then I'm going to go ahead and select my jurisdiction. I'll choose New York. And now I'm going to run my keyword search, duty to warn. And so these are all the briefs, pleadings, and motions from New York courts that have referenced my keywords. And so remember to use these filters on the left to further refine my results. Okay, so let's actually take a look at one of these briefs. There's the brief itself, and then if you're looking at a brief, you probably would also be interested in the eventual Court of Appeals opinion that was issued in response to the brief. You might be interested in looking at the briefs filed by the other parties. You might be interested in doing some further research and look at the topic report, so they're all right there on the right-hand side. You can also go ahead and download, you see where it says original source image up at the top there, so you can download a PDF if you're interested in getting a PDF copy or you're doing a site check. All right, so that is it for the video lecture. We're going to do a dockets exercise first thing in class. 
Then we'll move on to talking about litigation tools, all the different things that you can do when you're a litigator and the tools that you can use to move from the filing of the complaint all the way to evaluating a settlement offer. And then we'll do an exercise using one of those resources as well. Don't forget to take the week nine quiz. See you in class.